So today's topic is about aligning viral genome sequences. Um, so to kind of quickly recap what we've been doing so far, uh, so far we talked about what are some general problems that exist in computational molecular biology uh, or like computational molecular epidemiology. We talked about how do we sequence the first of a viral genome. Uh, we talked about how do we annotate an unknown brand new viral genome sequence. And last week we talked about how do we do sequencing in the middle of a pandemic? So assuming we have a high quality reference genome and we have a good genome annotation, how do I sequence new samples in the middle of a pandemic? And that was kind of where we left off at last week. So today is our first step towards actually analyzing these genome sequences. So up to this point, all we've been talking about is how do I collect them? But we haven't actually talked about the epidemiology side of things. How do I actually use this genome information collected from all these different patients to make inferences about the public health crisis that we might have. Uh, so the first computational task that we're going to talk about is what's called sequence alignment. And I'm going to get more in detail about what that exactly means, uh, but that's going to be kind of the focus of today's talk is how do we align viral genome sequences. And here's a general outline of today's talk. Uh, basically, we're going to first give some bio background about what are the different types of mutations that we can have. Uh, we're gonna reconnect that back to how mutations occur across a phylogeny, so across an evolutionary tree. And then we're gonna introduce two different bioinformatics problems, uh, the pairwise sequence alignment problem and the multiple sequence alignment problem. And then we're gonna end by talking about this technique called reference guided multiple sequence alignment. So first, let's talk about what the different types of mutations are. Uh, so there's a few common types of mutations that occur in viruses. The most common one is a substitution. So a substitution is when one nucleotide gets replaced with another nucleotide. So here, the T mutated into a G. Another type of mutation that's not nearly as common as substitutions, but still does happen, is called an insertion. So an insertion is when one or more nucleotides are added to a genome sequence. So for example, if the sequence used to be ACT, but then a G got inserted in between the C and the T. So that's an insertion, not as common as substitutions, especially for viruses, uh, but does happen. Another type of mutation is called a deletion. So a deletion is kind of like the inverse of an insertion. It's when one or more nucleotides are deleted. So here, if we imagine that ACGT was the original ancestral sequence, maybe this G got deleted from parent to child. So then the descendants only have ACT. And something that's pretty important about these mutations is that they're heritable. So they're passed down from any given uh, lineage down to its descendants. So from any given viral sample that occur that a mutation occurs in, all of the descendants of that viral sample will inherit that mutation. Okay, so any questions about these general common types of mutations? This is, so I'm not going to get into like the super nitty gritty molecular biology here, but just kind of from a higher level, this is the, the level of detail that you should care about for this problem. Make sense? Cool. Okay, and then the, the main takeaway also, in addition to what the types are, is that substitutions are the most frequent one. Insertions and deletions don't happen as frequently. Uh, there's a question, what would cause an insertion or a deletion to occur? So in general, all three of these types of mutations happen because the machinery that replicates DNA, or in this case, if we're talking about RNA viruses, uh, the, the machinery that kind of copies an RNA into DNA and then back into RNA. These proteins that do this, they're called polymerases. They're not perfect. So these polymerases, they're just these like biochemical structures that are like floating around and will eventually bind to something, like bind to a strand of RNA or DNA and then end up replicating it. Or in the case, so in RNA, we have reverse transcription and then transcription that causes it to go copy. But either way, these polymerases, they, um, they are error prone just because of how they physically look like. So when they make a mistake, that's when you have a substitution, insertion, or deletion. 
And then there's a question in the chat, will the influence of each type of mutation vary from type to type? So that's a great question. Um, so I don't think I talk about it too much in this lecture, um, but basically substitutions are the least problematic mutations. Um, so in general, if you think about it in the genome, parts of the genome code for proteins and parts of the genome don't code for proteins. In general, mutations of any of these three types that happen in the protein coding regions are more important. They're more heavily impacting the functionality of the virus rather than mutations that don't happen in the coding regions. Um, but then as far as these three types go, in the protein coding regions, if you have a substitution mutation, uh, what that'll end up doing is remember that uh, in the protein coding regions, the genome sequence encodes for some protein sequence. And remember that we had those like codon by codon by codon translations that we would do. So a substitution at most will change a single amino acid in the protein sequence, right? If we change one letter in the DNA sequence, that's going to change one letter of one codon. So at most, one amino acid in the protein is going to be different. Versus insertions and deletions, if we have an insertion or a deletion that's not a multiple of three, that's going to end up really breaking the protein. And if you imagine, um, here's my whiteboard. You can imagine that you could have a situation where like, let's say the original sequence was ACG, 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 ACG. But then if I have an insertion that happens between this C and this G, so maybe it becomes ACTG. So I'm just gonna maybe make it contiguous. So if I have a T get inserted here between the C and the G, then this is the resulting sequence that I would get. But if we think about it in terms of codons, the original sequence looked like this in terms of codons versus with this insertion, we now have what's called a frame shift mutation because it's not a multiple of three, this insertion. So all of my codons are super messed up, right? It used to be that like, right? So every single one of my codons is completely messed up. And the same goes for deletions. If I have a deletion that's not a multiple of three, all of my codons get messed up because it's a frame shift mutation. Yeah, great question. Any other questions about the types of mutations? Quit. So substitutions, in addition to being more frequent, they're much less significantly impacting the, uh, the virus. OK. So now let's talk about how mutations look like as they evolve down the phylogeny. So this, I think I presented a figure like this somewhere around week one. Um, but basically, you can imagine mutations happening over time as kind of imagine that we have this true evolutionary history of the virus. So each of these leaves represent a different modern day viral lineage. And kind of a single ancestor evolved over time. And these branching events happen from when it replicates. So if this was the, uh, and remember that forward in time is down along the tree. So it could be that along each of these branches in the evolutionary tree, mutations can occur. And where they occur, they get inherited all the way down. So imagine along this branch of the evolutionary tree, maybe this G turns into a C. That substitution is going to be passed down to all the descendants below this branch. And then maybe along this branch, this G actually gets deleted and turns into uh, just uh, it's deleted. So in this in this drawing, I'm drawing it as a gap, but in reality, we don't actually observe anything. So this sequence was ACGT, but now it just becomes ACT. So I'm drawing this gap just to show us the true evolutionary history. I'm representing it as it got deleted, but really it would just be nothingness. It would just be ACT. And as we go down the tree, maybe no additional mutations happen along this branch. So we directly inherited this ancestral sequence that just was this genome with this C mutation passed down versus maybe down this branch, maybe the A turned into a C. And then maybe here, maybe no additional mutations happened on this branch. So we just inherited this ancestral, uh, this ancestral sequence. And then maybe on this branch, 
this C mutated into a G. So this sequence is A, G, T. But again, I'm putting this gap here so it's easy for us to remember, oh, there used to be a letter there in the ancestor, but no longer. Okay, so does this kind of make sense? Like the mutations happening along branches of the tree and then getting passed down? Make sense, cool, okay. Okay, so this makes sense. But remember our fundamental problem here is all of this is hidden from us. We can't see any of the evolutionary history. All we can observe are these modern day sequences. And even worse, remember I told you that these gaps, I'm drawing them here, but in reality, they don't actually exist. So really, I don't even get to see these. All I see is the sequences without the gaps. Right, so all I see are these four sequences. And my problem is I'm trying to figure out the evolutionary history from just these sequences. Okay, so that motivates the first problem, which is called pairwise sequence alignment. So the pairwise sequence alignment is basically a computational problem in which my input, I have two sequences X and Y that I'm assuming came from some original common ancestor. And what I want to do is output a highest scoring alignment between X and Y. Uh, so basically what I'm doing is I'm sticking in these gap characters, these dashes, anywhere in either sequence that I want. I could put them in the first sequence, in the second sequence, in both, wherever I want, such that the score of my overall alignment is maximized. Right, so theoretically, I could have put this gap before the C, or I could have put it before the A, or I could have put it after the T to get them to be the same length. But I happen to put it here between the C and the T, but I could have put gaps anywhere I want. And what I want to do is basically find an alignment like this. So find an optimal placing of these gap characters such that the overall score of my alignment is maximized. So how exactly do I score it? Yeah, exactly. So great question. So that segues very nicely into the next part. I've talked about this score, but how do I actually define a scoring function that I can use to rate the different alignments that I can come up with? So we're gonna define a scoring function where we have this match score, this mismatch penalty, and this gap penalty. So any given column of my alignment, I'm going to define it as either a match if both letters are the same, a mismatch if the two letters are different, or a gap if one of the two sequences has that dash, that gap character in that column. So that's how I'm going to score each individual column of my alignment. And then the overall score of the alignment is just the sum of the scores of the different columns. So what does this look like? Imagine that I have these two sequences here and imagine that I'm trying to score this alignment. So this is one possible pairwise alignment between X and Y. I put a gap in between the A and the C in X and I didn't put any gaps in Y, right? The alignment just has to be the same length, but yeah, this is one possible alignment. So the score of this alignment is I go column by column by column and count the score of each column. So the first column, I have a match. I have an A in both sequences. So that's a plus one. In the second column, I have a gap, right? I have a letter with a gap character in the other sequence. So this is my gap penalty of minus one. In the next column, I have a C in one sequence and a G in the other sequence. So this is a mismatch. I have different letters in my two sequences in this column. So this is my mismatch penalty, which is minus one. And then the last column, I have T in one sequence and T in the other sequence. This is a match, so plus one. So what was it? It was plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, so the overall score of this alignment is zero. Any questions on how I computed that alignment score? Kind of makes sense. Versus let's try this other example. So let's try that first example that I showed. Oh, how do I determine 
the original? Like, are you saying, how do I determine um, X and Y? Yeah, so X and Y we've sequenced. So, so these are the actual sequences that we were able to generate from like the weeks two and four lectures. So either the genome assembly or the uh, consensus sequence from last week. Does that kind of make sense? Or it could be reads, right? It could be one sequence is the reference genome, or maybe I'll do this. Like maybe one sequence is a reference genome, one sequence is a read. Cool. Okay, let's try this next one. So this next one, it's the same exact sequence as X and Y, but now instead of putting the gap between A and C, I put the gap between C and T. So the first column, I have A in both sequences, so that's a match. The second column, I have a C in both sequences, so that's a match, so plus one, plus one. The third column, I have a gap in one of the sequences, so that's the gap penalty minus one. And then the fourth column, I have a T in both sequences. So T and T, that's a match. So that's plus one. So the overall score is plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, which is two. So this alignment has a higher score than this alignment. So this is the better alignment. And it turns out for these two sequences, two is the highest possible score that we could get. So this is our best possible alignment between X and Y. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about like, just what is a pairwise alignment? How do we determine optimality? Stuff like that. So why do we align them? What stage is this? So this is basically those deletions. So, so once I generate my sequences, before I can do anything with them, I need to be able to line up letters that correspond to each other. Right, so in my evolutionary history, each letter of my modern day sequences corresponded to some letter from my original ancestor sequence. And for me to be able to compare two sequences properly, so maybe I want to compute um, how many years have passed between these two sequences, or maybe I want to infer an evolutionary tree, I have to first determine sequence homology. I have to determine what parts of the sequence correspond to the same original letter in the ancestor. And I can do that by basically doing the sequence alignment. The sequence alignment helps me determine that like, oh, this A goes with this A, this C goes with this C, this T goes with this T. Can horizontal or lateral gene transfer complicate the problem? Wow, I did not expect anyone would know what horizontal gene transfer was. So that's awesome. Um, that's a great question. So for people that aren't familiar, uh, I've been drawing my evolutionary trees to look like, uh, let me get my, so I've been drawing evolutionary trees to look kind of like, like this tree structure here where, where we have a tree where every lineage just branches out. But it turns out that with some species, we can get really, really weird stuff where it could be that part of the genome had this evolutionary structure, but then it could be that like, this part of the genome merged with this part of the genome, or sorry, sorry this, this lineage over here had some type of a transfer of genetic information to this lineage here. It could be what's called recombination, which happens sometimes with viruses, um, with bacteria. There's what's called transformation, where bacteria can kind of just like soak up DNA that exists around them. Um, so this type of what we call horizontal or lateral gene transfer, where we have genetic material being transferred kind of across lineages, this does complicate the problem significantly. That's an excellent point. Uh, for the purposes of this class, we're going to pretend that this doesn't ever happen, which is nice because for viruses, they're such simple and such small genomes that assuming horizontal gene transfer doesn't exist is actually a pretty fair assumption. Uh, but if you deal with like more complex viruses like HIV, which has a lot of recombination, or if you deal with bacteria or stuff like that, um, horizontal gene transfer is a really, really challenging problem. Uh, but yeah, fortunately for us, we don't have to worry about it. But yeah, great question. Where, where did you learn about horizontal gene transfer, if you don't mind me asking? That's like um, a pretty advanced topic. 
Uh, I'm in an evolutionary biology class, and I'm also in field 70. So I learned something about phage, and that's this kind of a uh, horizontal gene transfer. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, great insights. Yeah, so for other types of species, like especially bacteria, it's a huge problem. But fortunately for us, we're dealing with a much simpler problem here. So there's another question in the chat. So this is comparing one strain of genes to another strain to see which is older. So, so we're not necessarily trying to see which is older. We're just trying to see which letters of this sequence correspond or are equivalent to which letters of this other sequence. So it could be uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome from one person compared to SARS-CoV-2 genome of another person. It could be spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 genome compared to spike protein of the original SARS genome. Uh, it could be hemoglobin in humans compared to hemoglobin in mice, for example. So in general, all we have is just two sequences that we know had some common ancestor way, way, way back when. And we're just trying to see which letters of this sequence correspond to which letter of the other sequence. And then afterwards, then we can ask questions like, okay, now that I've done this alignment, so now that I know sequence homology, um, so I know, so sequence homology just means this letter corresponds to this letter, this letter corresponds to this letter. Homology just means which letters correspond to the same letter in the ancestor. So once I've determined sequence homology, that's when I can ask questions like, what is the evolutionary history? Or um, how much time has passed between these two sequences? Or um, yeah, stuff like that. Does that kind of make sense? So we're not actually trying to learn any functional information yet. We're just trying to see which letter from this sequence corresponds to which letter in the other sequence. Like this letter corresponds to this letter, and then this letter corresponds to this letter, and then this letter doesn't correspond to anything in the other sequence. That is sequence homology, and that's what we're trying to find. And then in future weeks, so why would you want to check the corresponding letters? Yeah, so in like the following weeks, we're going to talk about algorithms that we can use that rely on this. So hold on to that thought. It's going to be very important kind of in the very near future. That's a great question. Why do we even care about this? It's going to help us do some downstream stuff later. Uh, so there's a question. We're using pairwise alignment to infer sequence homology. Yep. The pairwise alignment is finding the sequence homology. We do this pairwise alignment, and then each column of the pairwise alignment, if I have two letters, that is sequence homology. Or it's our best guess. It's not necessarily correct, but it's our best guess at sequence homology. Cool. OK, so we talked about what is a pairwise alignment, and we talked about what is the optimal pairwise alignment. But as you can imagine, I don't want to have to try to compute every single possible pairwise alignment between two sequences, compute the score, and pick the maximum. That would take way too long if I tried to exhaustively search across every single possible uh, pairwise alignment. So the question that we should ask is, OK, pairwise alignment is important, but how do I even find the optimal pairwise alignment in the first place? So there's an algorithm called the needleman wunsch algorithm which is an algorithm that finds the highest scoring pairwise alignment between two sequences. Uh, I'm not going to go over the super, super nitty gritty details about this algorithm, because this is actually like a pretty, like if, you, if you're a bioinformatics major, you're going to learn about this when you get to CSE 181. Um, but it's a pretty advanced topic. But just know that the algorithm exists. And I'm going to do a quick, simple overview of it um, to kind of like give you a taste of it. And then later, you can explore it more in depth if you want. But what we end up doing is basically we build a matrix where the number of columns is one plus the length of one of the sequences, and the number of rows is one plus the length of the other sequence. So here I have one of my sequences on the top, one of my sequences as the columns. And we can basically fill in this matrix using our match, mismatch, and gap penalties, uh, where we use this technique called dynamic programming. And I'm just going to kind of like quickly click through this matrix just to show that we would like fill in all these slots. I don't want to get into any of the details of how we actually do this, um, just because it's pretty complicated. But if you're interested, feel free to email me and I can send you some resources. But yeah, we fill in this matrix. 
And we fill in not only a score, but we fill in these arrows. And again, I can give you details of how the algorithm works kind of offline if you're interested. And then we can backtrack from the bottom right corner of this matrix to reconstruct the actual pairwise alignment. So yeah, again, I'm not gonna go into any much more detail than this because this is a pretty advanced topic. Um, but the key takeaway here is if these two sequences are length K, you have to fill in this K by K matrix. So this scales quadratically with respect to K. So if I double the length of my sequences, if I double K, right? So if K was 10, I would do a hundred cells that I have to fill, or I guess if K was 99, I would fill out a hundred cells. It would be 10 by 10. If K was, um, right, if I double K though, I quadruple how many boxes I have to fill. So this scales quadratically with respect to the length of my sequences. Okay, so I don't wanna to get too much more into depth about that algorithm, but just know there exists an algorithm that can fairly efficiently compute this pairwise alignment. Okay, so how does that help us? Well, let's introduce the concept of multiple sequence alignment. Uh, so I just told you that aligning two sequences scales quadratically with the length of the sequences. So this big O notation, if you take any future computer science classes, you're gonna use this later on, but basically it just means on the order of, is a, is a nice way of summarizing it. So basically the time it takes to align two sequences of length K is on the order of K squared. It scales roughly quadratically with K. So it turns out that we can actually use a similar algorithm to align three sequences of length K. So instead of doing this square, this table, I can do a three-dimensional matrix. So I would fill in this Q. And in general, to align N sequences of length K, this approach would be big O of K to the N power, K to the number of sequences. It scales proportionally to K raised to the power of the number of sequences you have. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Does this have to do with efficiency of the algorithm? Like how fast it gives an output? Absolutely. So this big O notation, it's what's called time complexity. That if you're curious about that, I can send you, um, I cover this a little bit in the textbook that I wrote, but basically big O notation is like the, the notation of saying, how fast is this algorithm? Yeah, great question. Okay, so, so basically what we're getting at is if I have N sequences, so for example, if I collect N genomes of COVID-19 from all of these different patients, I could theoretically align them to figure out that sequence homology across all of them in big O of K to the N. So roughly on the order of the length of the genome raised to the power of number of sequences I have, if I use this exact approach. But the problem here is with COVID-19, this is a really, really, really big problem. So the COVID-19 genome, each of those genome sequences is roughly 29,000 letters long. And the number of sequences we have is over 4 million at this stage. And this is actually, ideally, we want this number to be even bigger because we wanna be able to collect sequences from every single person that gets infected. So even just with what we have right now, if we assume that every single operation took exactly one nanosecond, so every single one of these K to the N operations that we have to do, if we assumed each of them took only one nanosecond, the time it would take to do 29,000 raised to the power of 4 million, that's longer than the existence of the entire universe. So clearly, even though we've solved the problem, it's not actually a reasonable solution for us because it's way, 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 way too slow. So instead of doing that kind of matrix filling out approach, which is guaranteed to give you an exact multiple sequence alignment, there's what are called heuristics. There's algorithms that are not guaranteed to give you the exact best answer, but they generally give you pretty good answers. So they give you pretty good approximate alignments. And these algorithms scale quadratically with respect to the number of sequences times the length of the sequences plus quadratically with respect to the number of sequences 
times, uh, sorry, the length of sequences times the number of sequences. So this n squared term is a lot more reasonable for us. 4 million squared times 29,000 is a lot more reasonable than 29,000 raised to the 4 millionth power. Does that kind of make sense? And again, I don't want to get super in depth about how these algorithms actually work, because this is typically like a graduate algorithms concept. Uh, but for our purposes, we as the computational biologist can just take existing really fancy tools that people have built that do this for us. All right, so there's a question in the chat. What exactly is a heuristic? Heuristic is just a way of saying it's not guaranteed to be correct, but it usually does pretty good. Um, right, so in, in computer science, we have what are called exact solutions. So exact solutions are guaranteed to give you the absolute best answer versus what we have what are called heuristics that they're not guaranteed to give you the best answer, but they hopefully will give you a pretty good answer. So for example, if I asked you like, how long is it going to take for me to drive to campus today? You could hopefully tell me like, oh, it'll take you 22.378 seconds to get to campus. And that would be awesome. But you might say, oh, it'll take roughly 20 minutes. Um, so a heuristic is an inexact answer that's hopefully pretty close to the true real answer. Does that kind of make sense? And for our purposes, it's good enough because doing the exact solution is going to be way too long. Cool, yeah, so again, we don't have to write this ourselves. We, as the computational biologists, can kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and just take existing tools that people have built and just use those for our purposes. Uh, so there's a question also, why does that formula work? Uh, so for the exact derivation, don't worry about it too much. Um, like the, to understand where this comes from, you have to kind of get into the nitty gritty about the algorithm. Um, so for now, just take it at face value that this happens to be how long it takes. And if you want, I can send you the link to the paper and you can you can take a closer look. But deriving it is actually a fairly complicated process. Uh, there's a question. Just wonder, what is the time normally required to run the algorithm? I feel like the computer will give the answer almost immediately, but it looks like this doesn't only happen. Yeah, so for biology, that's actually a big problem is that a lot of these algorithms, because of how big our data sets are, are very slow. So, um, so this tool, math, this is kind of the best tool for doing multiple sequence alignment right now. Um, so I like I think in the middle of the pandemic, I was doing this with like maybe 200,000 COVID-19 genomes. And it was taking like, like anywhere between four and six hours to run with 200,000. And it scales quadratically with the number of sequences. So if it takes like four to six hours for 200,000 sequences, and now we have 4 million sequences, then if we're multiplying the run time, sorry, if we're multiplying n by 20, we would be multiplying the run time by 20 squared, so by 400. So four to six hours would turn into probably, I don't know, like if we multiply by 400, like 1600 hours or something, which is crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of computational problems, especially when we get into next week's topic, that they take like weeks to run, uh, which is super wild. <laughs> yeah, so keep that 400-ish hours estimate for math in mind, because that's going to leverage itself nicely to the next topic, which is actually something that I published last year, which is pretty nifty. Um, so, so first, OK, so kind of finishing off, so multiple sequence alignment is basically I'm finding that homology between all of the genomes that I've collected. And then, as I mentioned before, I want to find that homology so that I can do later stuff kind of further on. Uh, so Kevin said, yeah, that's about three and a half months. Yeah, it's wild. Um, it, it, and that's, yeah, it, so it's pretty crazy like how big these data sets can get. You can have like really, really computationally intensive problems. Um, I mean, actually, I, like as a nice kind of maybe um, maybe as an aside, so UCSD actually is home to the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is like the biggest supercomputer center, I think like, I don't think it's in the country, but I think 
like it's one of the two biggest ones in the entire country. And like, I think half the country does their high performance computing on the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Uh, and bioinformatics is one of the big things that's done at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. So it's pretty cool. I don't know if you've ever been walking next to like, it's between Marshall and Revell, not, it's between Marshall and ERC, uh, right next to the Hopkins parking structure. There's like a gray building just before Remac. Um, and that's the supercomputer center. Yeah, exactly, right next to Remac. And periodically they have, um, they have tours. So if you're ever interested, you can actually stop in and like take a tour of the supercomputer center, which is really cool. Yeah, so just a fun nifty thing. So yeah, so people that do computations on there, that's where you'll see some of these like three month long compute jobs, which is wild. Cool, okay, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is this thing called reference guided multiple sequence alignment. So remember that um, when we introduced COVID-19, we mentioned that very early on in the pandemic, we had a high confidence reference genome that was created. I think it was like somewhere in February or something. Um, and also remember that with COVID-19 and with a lot of viruses in general, because they don't necessarily mutate super, 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 super quickly all the time, we expect that most viral genomes are gonna be extremely similar to the reference genome, right? We expect that they're not gonna deviate too much from the reference genome. They might deviate a little bit, but not too much. So if we know in advance that our sequences are gonna be very, very similar to each other, and specifically, they're gonna be very, very similar to a high confidence reference genome, uh, which I've shown the reference genome here in green, instead of doing this blind multiple sequence alignment that I'm just comparing all of them with each other and filling that n-dimensional cube, why don't I instead compare each individual genome independently directly against the reference genome. So instead of doing this multiple sequence alignment all at once, why don't I just do pairwise alignments against the reference genome? And then if I do pairwise alignments against the reference genome, I can take those pairwise alignments and basically use the reference genome as scaffolds with which I can merge the columns of my multiple sequence alignment. So basically what I would do is say, okay, so this is the first letter of my reference genome. Let me find which letter of each of my sequences aligned to the first letter of my reference genome, right? So in my reference genome, the first column, like the first letter's column, what was the letter in each of my genome's pairwise alignments with that first letter of the reference genome? And I'm gonna, squish those all together and say that's the first column of my multiple sequence alignment. Let me do the same thing with the second column. Let me see which letter in each of my genomes aligned with the second letter of my reference genome. And I'm just gonna call all of those letters the second column of my multiple sequence alignment. And just kind of keep going all the way through. So does that approach kind of make sense before I move on? So what I'm doing is doing pairwise alignments against my reference genome, and then just concatenating all of the letters of all my genomes that map to the first letter of my reference genome. Concatenate all the letters of my genomes that map to the second letter of my reference genome, third letter, fourth letter, and then each letter of my reference genome defines one column of my multiple sequence alignment. Does that kind of make sense? Is it divided into codons for comparisons? If you wanted to, you could break this down and actually like, so there are some tools that you can actually kind of break this down and say, this is one gene, this is one gene. And I've detected that this is the corresponding gene in this genome. And this part corresponds to that gene in this genome. And then you can do a codon by codon alignment between each of these. You could do that if you wanted to. And there's a tool called uh, Viruline that does exactly that. It basically takes your annotated genome and it does pairwise alignments of each individual gene, kind of codon by codon by codon with the reference genome. You don't necessarily have to though. Yeah, great question. <laughs> 
Uh, so there's a question, what exactly is compared in each DNA strand? Is it usually just genes or proteins? So it's actually just the entire DNA sequence. So remember, not the entire, I guess, RNA for viruses, but the entire genome sequence. And remember, the genome sequence includes genes, but it also includes parts of it that don't code for genes, right? There's coding and non-coding parts of the genome, and we're comparing the entire genome, coding and non-coding parts together against the entire reference genome. So not usually proteins, but usually it's the whole genome that includes genes and the non-coding parts of the genome as well. Yeah, so why is this good? What are the benefits of this align to reference approach? Well, the main one is that I'm doing these pairwise alignments against the reference independently. So in multiple sequence alignment, I have to kind of do the entire alignment together. I have to fill that entire matrix and kind of keep all of my sequences in mind as I'm doing the alignment. But here, I can align the first sequence to the reference genome. I can align the second sequence to the reference genome. And I can do each of those individual pairwise alignments with the reference genome completely independently. So one really nice feature about that is that there's a ton of room for parallelization. Theoretically, I could do all of those pairwise alignments at the exact same time, right? I don't have to do them sequentially. I can just do, if I have 4 million of them and I have like a 16 core computer, I could do 16 pairwise alignments at a time. If I have a supercomputer, like from the supercomputer center, and I have like, I don't know, a thousand cores available to me, I could do a thousand pairwise alignments at a time. So this parallelizes super, super, super nicely. And another benefit of this approach is that it scales linearly as a function of the sequences, right? So I'm doing a pairwise alignment of each sequence of the reference genome, but if I double the number of genomes I have, well, the length of the genomes is staying the same. It's always going to be 29,000 for COVID-19, or always going to be the length of the genome for whatever virus you're looking at. So the individual pairwise alignments are not going to change how long they take. And if I double how many genomes I have, I'm just going to have to do twice as many pairwise alignments, so it'll take twice as long. So this scales linearly with how many sequences I have. So it's much better for a rapidly growing, super big pandemic like COVID-19. So yeah, so it's much more feasible as the data set size grows. But one key limitation here that I kind of glossed over is this hard to handle insertions with respect to the reference genome. So if my genome sequence has a match to the reference genome, oh, uh, there's a question in the chat. Would this be represented as big O of NK? Uh, it would be big O of NK squared because you do a K squared pairwise alignment for each individual genome. And then you do N of those pairwise alignments because you have N genomes. So it's big O of K squared per pairwise alignment times big O of N pairwise alignments. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, great question. So K squared is bigger than K, but at least it's fixed. It doesn't grow throughout the pandemic. It's always going to be 29,000 length genome. But yeah, so, so a limitation of this approach is if I match the reference genome, or if I mismatch the reference genome, or if I have a deletion with respect to the reference genome, those are all easy to handle because what I'm basically doing is just taking each letter of my reference genome and for each of my sequences, just seeing what letter matched against that position, whether it was a letter in my genome or if it was a uh, deletion. Oh, there, there's a question, what was the pro between piecewise and reference? So the, the benefit is that it's faster. I can do it super quickly because it doesn't scale so my original multiple sequence alignment was big O of um, K to the power of N. So N is what's growing rapidly in the pandemic. So N is growing exponentially in a pandemic. So I have K raised to some variable that's actually increasing exponentially versus by doing it um, aligned to reference, I'm getting it to be big O of N times k squared. So remember, k is constant here. k is not going to change. And as a result, k squared is also not going to change throughout the pandemic, because the genome length is always going to be the same. Uh, so I just typed these in the chat. Maybe I'll do it on the whiteboard. 
So, um, yeah, so let me just type those out. So, uh, original multiple sequence alignment is big O of K to the N. And actually the, the heuristics were big O of N squared. Uh, so K times N squared plus uh, N times A squared. Let me, uh, there we go. And then the line to reference is big O of N times K squared. So throughout the pandemic, K is always gonna be 29,000. It doesn't matter if we're on the first day of the pandemic, doesn't matter if we're 10 months into the pandemic, the genome length is always gonna be the same. Let me actually write this down. K equals length of genome, N equals number of genomes. So the problem here is that n grows exponentially. So n grows exponentially throughout the pandemic. So here, k raised to the power of this like super, super big, currently 4 million exponent is huge. Versus here, n squared, so 4 million squared is also pretty big. But this is just n. So this scales linearly rather than quadratically with respect to the number of sequences. So here, if I double how many genomes I have, it's going to raise the total runtime by a lot. Here, if I double this, the number of genomes, if I double n, I'm going to quadruple the runtime. So if I multiply the number of genomes by 2, I'm going to multiply the runtime by roughly 4. Versus here, if I multiply the number of sequences by 2, I'm going to uh, multiply the runtime by two. Uh, so the question these formulas are asking, they're about how much time, not the sequencing, the, the analysis, the processing time. Uh, so I'm going to quickly, I'm just going to finish off these slides because we're, we're pretty much out of time. And then I'll stay on to answer some questions. Um, so, so basically, the key limitation here is that it's hard to keep track of insertions with respect to the genome. Um, oh, there's a question. If insertions happen, will K change? Yeah, insertions and deletions will change K, but we don't expect very many insertions or deletions. So for COVID-19, I think there's like three common insertions that are each of like length three. So I think it went from like 29,000-ish to like 29,000 plus six or something. So you don't expect K to change very much. Okay, so just real quickly, so this align to reference approach, it's hard for us to handle insertions with respect to the reference genome. So what we can do is just throw away the insertions. Uh, it's not going to be technically correct, but for the downstream analyses that we're going to do, it actually doesn't change the answers very much. Or you could just update the reference genome to include common insertions. So insertions with respect to the reference genome I can't keep track of easily, but I can keep track of deletions with respect to the reference genome. So for example, if in the pandemic, oh, so someone has to go, yeah, no worries, thanks. Yeah, if you have to head out, feel free. Uh, I'm almost done, so I'm just gonna quickly finish up. So yeah, so insertions are hard to keep track of, but deletions are easy to keep track of. So what I could do is just update the reference genome to include those insertions. Um, so it turns out that, so I'm just gonna kind of click through these. So it turns out that instead of implementing this align to reference approach from scratch, we can actually take advantage of read mapping tools. So there's tools like Minimap2 that I mentioned last time that can map reads against a reference genome. And what we're basically doing is just mapping really, really long reads-ish against the reference genome. It's not quite the same thing, but it's very similar to that problem. So I wrote a tool called Viral MSA that basically just wraps around existing read mappers to just call the read mapping tool to do those pairwise alignments against the reference genome. Um, so I wrap around a few of these tools to demonstrate flexibility, but Minimap2 is the one that I recommend. Uh, and you can find it here. So it basically does this reference guided multiple sequence alignment approach by just easily wrapping around existing tools. So I'm going to call it there. I'll stay on the line. Sorry, I went a couple minutes over. Uh, but feel free to check out this tool. It's in Python and it just kind of wraps around existing tools. Um, super short paper. I think it's like two pages.
And yeah, so for context, remember I said earlier, MAFT, which was the other tool that heuristic that I mentioned, would take like 1600 hours to align 4 million genomes. My tool can do it in a few minutes, which is pretty crazy. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. Could you explain a little bit about the difference between read mapping and pairwise alignment? They're actually the exact same thing. So read mapping is just pairwise alignment of reads to a reference genome. So read mapping is pairwise alignment. 